Today we're beginning a new series called True Worship. Worship is something that is very dear to our house. We love not only the music factor of worship and not only we love the good looking worship team that we have, amen, and the amazing albums that they release, but we love the spirit, the heart of worship which honors God and Jesus is looking for, amen. Napoleon said that if Socrates would come into the building, everybody will stand up in honor. But if Christ comes into the building, everybody will fall in reverence. The reason we worship and the reason we get on our knees and we'll raise our hands and we adore is because Jesus Christ is God. He's not like Thanos who becomes God by getting all the infinity stones and crushing the rest of the planets. Our God didn't become God. Our God was God, is God and forever will be God. Come on somebody. He didn't become God by crushing everything that came on his way. He was, is and forever will be and gave his son being God so that we will be rescued. And that's why he's worthy to worship. Another reason why we bow, get on our knees, lift our hands, clap, shout and sing praises to God is not just because of who he is but who he is to us. We always remember where we came from. There was a story when the prisoners in Iran were released I think it was a uh, 19 don't remember the exact day but when they were released from prison through the negotiations of a president and they arrived back on American soil and the first thing they did is they kissed the ground of the United States you know for an average person who walks in America you don't kiss the ground in America because you take it for granted but if you were a prisoner in Iran and you come back from that prison and you land in this blessed country you will kiss the ground and see the reason why we get on our knees before God because we remember we used to be prisoners of sickness prisoners of the devil prisoners of curse prisoners of these things and we constantly remember where we've been through what God has taken us from and that's why during worship we worship not the style not the preference of our songs not the music loudness or quietness of it but the God who is the object of our worship can somebody say amen come on somebody let's put our hands together for the Lord let's put our hands together for Jesus I heard this I heard this lady she was in Kansas City and as she walked into a ice cream shop she noticed Paul Newman who was a directing directing a film in that city Mr. and Miss Bridge and as she saw the director of the movie standing in line to get ice cream you know blue eyes this handsome man very known very popular she started to shake uncontrollably she, she started to her pulse you know went up she just started to sweat and get very nervous and and he said hi to her and she said hi back to him and she gets her ice cream and walks off the store and forgets that she didn't get the ice cream goes back to the store and he's standing again there and he says you forgot your ice cream huh she says yes I did he says you put it in your purse <laughs> When was the last time God's presence affected your pulse? When was the last time the presence of God caused you to shake? Get a little bit nervous because God came into the room. When people would meet God in the Old Testament, they would fall on the face like dead. When people would meet God in the New Testament, the Bible says that they, they would, their life would change. I can't I don't believe that you can meet God and remain the same. I believe you can stand in front of the semi truck on the highway get hit and remain the same but you can't meet God and remain the same. You can put your fingers in the outlet please don't do that and remain the same but you can't meet God and be the same. When God truly encounters your life and that happens during worship something changes about you. Come on somebody amen. So today we are approaching the topic of worship. I want you to see the verse in Isaiah 43 verse 7 everyone who is called by my name whom I have created for my glory I have formed him yes I have made him God in here reveals that God formed us for his glory God created us for worship we were called to warfare but we were created for worship we are in this world in the war zone from the beginning of creation the man was called to dominion and to warfare 
God created man with an assignment to have dominion. That means our assignment on this earth is to wage war against demons, to wage war against sickness, to wage war against poverty, to wage war against spirits and curses. But our calling, who we were created to be, is for the glory of God. Meaning we were created to worship. Somebody say, I was created to worship. Turn to your neighbor and say, you were created to worship. God has the same right for worship as you have for your car keys or your iPhone. It belongs to God. I want you to see this next verses where it says, God says in Malachi, He says, where is my honor? Meaning God thinks honor belongs to Him. It's rightfully His. Kind of like your keys. When you lose your keys in the church and you don't simply, if somebody takes your keys, you don't simply say, well, it's fine. You want to take them today. That is yours. Um, I'll find a ride home. I'll call Uber. Oh, by the way, they don't, we don't have that in Pasco. Um, but I'll call my friend. I'll call taxi. No, no, no. Your keys, they're yours. They are rightfully yours. God says, where is my honor? It's mine. Who took it? Who's holding it back? God sees praise and worship as rightfully His as anything that I own belongs rightfully to me. In 1st Chronicles 29 it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory. In Revelation 4.11 it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. In Psalm 115.1 it says, Not to us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. In Isaiah 42, 8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory, I will not give to anyone. I want to tell you something, that when it comes to worship, God thinks it belongs to Him. That means that if I take it, I'm a thief. If I don't give it back to God, that's not something that's going to be really good. Worship belongs to God. There were people in the Bible, in the history, who withheld worship from God. And instead of giving worship to God, they decided to keep it. One of them, the famous guy, Lucifer. We remember when Lucifer said, I will exalt, I will exalt, I, I, I. In few verses, he said, I five times. Anytime I is the center of the universe, you become like him. And Lucifer never planned to be the devil. Lucifer simply held worship, something that belonged to God, and became the devil. When we withhold worship, we go from the best of us to the worst of us. It damages us and it destroys us. Lucifer wasn't the only one. There was a guy that followed his footsteps. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, he also withheld worship. One time he came and looked at all the things that God has given to him. And he says, is this not my might that accomplished me? Is this not my glory? And there was a voice from heaven and he became an animal. Until he recognized there is a God who appoints kings and puts kings down. And when he says, God, to you be all the glory. He wasn't a believer, but he was a worshiper. He recognized, I might not be a Christian, but I recognize worship doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. When you hold worship back, it destroys you. Because worship is not yours to keep. Worship is yours to give. Come on, somebody. There was a guy in the New Testament. His name was Herod. And the Bible says there was a meeting in the city. And people came and people started to worship him. People started to honor him. And worms came and they ate his body. Because worship is not mine to keep. It's mine to give. God says in Romans chapter 1, he says the people who knew God but didn't worship him as God. He says that God allowed their minds to become futile and their hearts to be darkened. And he gave them up to their own passions, meaning they became the worst version of themselves because they knew God but didn't give him what was due to his name. You may say, but I'm not a Christian. You may say, what about people who don't believe in God? Actually, it does not really matter. If your phone is yours and people don't believe in your existence it doesn't change the fact your phone is yours they don't like you it doesn't change the fact it's yours God says I don't care worship is mine you may say well that's kind of egoistic of God he's God has no beginning has no end has no opponents no competition no rival didn't become God and worship doesn't corrupt him. The more worship he gets, he doesn't become meaner. He doesn't become evil. He doesn't become corrupt like we, us when we get worship. God becomes, is, always will be good. The only body, only one person 
only one being who can be all powerful and at the same time all good. Everybody else who gets the glory right away it goes into their head and they become manipulators, they become liars and they become bad. Worship is dangerous for us to carry. Actually word glory in the original Hebrew is a word for weight. Glory is the weight we carry and our spine is not strong enough to carry that kind of weight. Only God is strong enough to carry the weight of worship. When you take worship and hold it, it messes up with your back. It messes up with your system. It messes up with your character. It messes up with you. But when God takes worship, it doesn't mess up with his back. It doesn't mess up with him. It doesn't change him. You may say, but I am, I am better than anybody else. Lucifer was better than you and I and worship was too heavy for his back. It snapped and he became evil. He became corrupt. He became a destroyer. He became someone that gives people sickness today and gives people evil. Anytime you give somebody worship, it snaps them. It changes them. It doesn't make them good. It makes them bad. But you give worship to God, God's already good. But He becomes good to you. Come on somebody. Are you with me? Withholding worship corrupts us, destroys us. You may say, well, I'm not one of those people. I don't go around worshiping me and I don't ask people to worship me. But how many times it magnifies our problems, magnifies our fears, our worries. It actually makes the problems we have more permanent when the worship opportunity comes in and we hold it back. And we hold it back during worship time. Now I understand we, we really hold it back for two reasons. First is pride. Pride manifests in this way. Not my favorite song. Uh, too loud. Now I understand we, we need to keep it keep it nice. We need to keep the volume and everything nice but in reality it's not really about the song and secondly it's not really about you. We're not worshiping worship. We worship God because some people they are in love with worship not with God. The reason why we hold back worship back in our services and our hands don't go up, our lips are not open. Well I don't know the song. You can learn it. Well, I, I'm not sure. I don't really like that. Man, first thing is pride. The second one is problems. Problems are so big where we simply say, well, I can't today. Why? Because I'm just really going through some things. Actually, you can't afford not to. Because the only way to get out of those things is to worship. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. One of the biggest reasons you need to worship, I need to worship, it's not because I was created, it's not only because if I don't I become something that's not good, my worries become the stronghold, not only that but because whatever I worship I become. And Corinthians it says that we behold the glory of God as in the mirror and we are being transformed meaning whatever you behold you become. During worship, you're not beholding your sickness, you're beholding the healer. During worship, you're not beholding poverty, you're be beholding a provider. During worship, you're not beholding your single life, you're beholding someone who's a matchmaker. During worship, you're not beholding your situation, you're beholding God who is bigger than that. And so whatever you're beholding, you are becoming. They did a, even a study and they po posted in one of the newspapers where couples that are married for a very long time become like each other. And so it's been proven scientifically because you are actually looking at each other for so long, so many years, you become to look like each other. There is a picture of the two couples. You see how they look each like each other? Miserable but nevertheless. <laughs> Why? Because you become what you behold. If you behold somebody for 40 years, you become like them. Sour little face, depressed a little bit, discouraged a little bit, those wrinkles and everything. You become what you behold. But what would happen if you behold the glory and the beauty of God? What would happen if instead of staring in the face of your problems, in the face of your feelings, in the face of your disappointments, in the face of people's opinions, the haters, in the face of whatever you're going through, you lift your eyes to the hills where you come, your help comes from and you look as in the mirror to the glory of God, you become like God. God is rich, you become rich. God has no cancer, you begin to have cancer leave your body. God is not broke, you begin to see poverty being defeated in your life.
God he lives in the presence of peace you begin to see a flood of peace in your life that passes understanding God is powerful you begin to stop being pitiful and become powerful God begins to change your life you stop being a victim you become a victor why because you become what you behold that's why worship is so important because during worship you lift your eyes from whatever you're going through and you fix your eyes on him and he transforms you the key to change you is not to try to change you it's just change what you behold change what you behold is how you change who you are change what you observe change what you're fascinated with is how we change who we are can somebody say amen there is three types of worship the first one is the idol worship idol worship is when we worship something or someone that is created instead of a creator and we know that it brings demons we know that it's wrong and we know that everyone worships something are you with me everyone really worships something uh, there's no no such a thing as nobody's worshiping anything and many people in this culture instead of worshiping God they're worshiping really an idol that idol can come in the form of a car a job that idol can come in the form even of a person it could come even in the form of themselves the second type of worship is idol worship it's when we worship God but with lips only it's a worship Jesus rebuked in Pharisees because they knew they had the form of worship not the spirit they had the style not the substance idol worship it's when you memorize the flow of the service you know the song so well that you can actually do an Amazon shopping in your mind and sing along you can plan your weekly schedule and actually go through the whole motion of worship and God calls that idol worship one time men had a dream and in the dream an angel came and took him to a church service where there was a beautiful setting people were singing songs and hymns and during the service the man noticed and asked the angel he says I'm not hearing anybody sing I'm not hearing the sound I see everybody singing and worshiping but I don't hear anything and the angel looked back at him and he says this is what we get when men sing with their lips not with their heart he says heaven hears nothing they see the facial expressions they see the raising of the hands but they don't see anything because worship is not meant to be a lip service to God it's meant connected with our heart and with our spirit so the first one is idol worship the second one is idol worship and the third one is ideal worship and ideal worship is what Jesus told Samaritan woman he says that those who worship God must worship God in spirit meaning your heart has to be connected with your lips spirit meaning the Holy Spirit is helping you and the second one is truth it's truth what does it mean to worship God in truth now we know that truth is subjective in our culture today truth is different than facts facts change truth doesn't truth is eternal Jesus says I am the truth what does it mean to worship God in truth and before we go into communion and pray for healing I want us to look at the verse in the Bible where worship was mentioned for the first time and I want us to see what God reveals there that connects to what Jesus reveals to the Samaritan woman where worship to God must come in spirit and in truth if you go to Genesis chapter 22 verse 5 it says the following and Abraham said to his young man stay here with the donkey the lad and I will go yonder and what does it say what does it say church the lad and I will go yonder and and then he says and we will come back to you did you notice that he says we will come back to you God says hey, to Abraham to sacrifice Isaac I want you to notice this is completely for free um, that Abraham tells the guys we're coming back together meaning Abraham knew Isaac is not gonna die even though he was willing to offer to him now talk about faith but I want you to see that in here Abraham says we will go and worship now my definition of worship and yours is worship requires instruments, musicians, song, it requires a man behind the board, it requires a congregation but in here in Genesis chapter 2 we don't see a worship team, we don't see a song, we don't see music, we don't see nothing except an altar and a sacrifice and Abraham says we will go up and worship. First definition of worship in the Bible has nothing to do with songs and singing and posture and style and form of worship it has to do with the spirit of worship and that is obedience and what is obedience it's approaching God on God's terms 
because Abraham comes to God and offers to him Isaac. Now we understand this is complicated for some people because we see God requiring a human sacrifice. God actually is demonstrating something here because God is asking Abraham to give his son out of obedience with something God will do thousands years later where he will give his son out of love. And God is letting Abraham experience just a drop in the ocean of what he will do when he will give his own son. Except not because somebody asked him but because love asked him to give his son. And the fact that God says to Abraham don't, don't offer your son to me. God wasn't after Isaac. God want, didn't want to remove Isaac from Abraham's life. God wanted to remove Isaac from his heart. That's really what was God after. But the whole part of here, the whole idea the whole hero of this story is not Abraham, it's God. God showing to Abraham, you want to approach me in worship? You have to offer the sacrifice I give you, not your sacrifice. Abraham, Isaac will be a sacrifice that will cost you everything. But Isaac costs me nothing. I want you to offer a sacrifice that costs me something. And your sacrifice is simply obedience to what I provide for you. 2,000 years ago God provided a sacrifice on the cross. His name was Jesus Christ. And God is saying to us today, worship is when you come to me and you offer to me, you come to me through, you come to me caring, you come to me, the truth of worship is you come to me with Jesus Christ as someone you go to me through. You don't come to me through your deeds. You don't come to me through your good works. You don't come to me through your perfect church attendance. You don't come to me through the three fasting days that you do as a church. You don't come to me through none of the stuff. You put it aside and you come to me through Jesus Christ who is the truth. And only through Jesus we approach God in worship. Amen. Only through Jesus. When I have Jesus, in Jesus I have everything else. In Jesus I have healing. In Jesus I have deliverance. In Jesus I have freedom. In Jesus is victory. In Jesus is provision for all of our needs. In Jesus. And not only we offer Jesus to God and say, Lord, we come to you today, not in our name, not in our goodness, but through Jesus Christ. But in Jesus that we have is not only the salvation of our souls, but also the blessing for our life. I want you to see that Abraham offers a ram to God and God speaks back to Abraham. He doesn't just rescue him. He says, Abraham, I swear I will bless you. It's like, but God, you already gave me a sacrifice. I'm already good. God says, I know. But when you offer a sacrifice, not only you please me with your worship because it's offered in truth, but I also on the top of that give you something more. Today we're going to pray for healing. And healing is already provided in Jesus Christ. Healing is already provided in Jesus Christ. Amen. But let's say you're one of those people today that you grew up where you were told in Jesus is only salvation for your soul. Nothing else. Jesus is only to get you a ticket to heaven. Jesus is a sacrifice just so God can be pleased with you and nothing else is in Jesus. Well I could tell you that that teaching was wrong. Because the Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. The Bible says when he died on the cross, he also became poor so that through his sacrifice on the cross, we can receive financial breakthrough. The Bible says that on the cross, he became a curse so we can receive blessing of Abraham. The Bible says that on the cross, he saw the shame that was set before him and he overcame that. That means that we can experience freedom from rejection through the cross. But let's for a moment imagine that on the cross, Jesus only died for our sin and for our forgiveness. Apostle Paul says, in Romans he says he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall not he with him also freely give us all things that means God says not only I gave you my son and if you are limited in your perspective about the sacrifice of Christ and you think it's only to give you salvation God says well I give you a promise not only I gave you my son freely somebody say freely meaning for free. You don't have to earn it. You don't even have to have big faith for it. Freely I will give you anything else that you need along with Jesus Christ. Not only I gave a ram but God also gives Abraham a promise and God goes in into swearing. He says, I swear I'll bless you. I swear I'll heal you. I swear I'll provide for you. I swear I'll break the curse. I'll, I swear. You know it's serious when God starts swearing.
you know it's serious when God starts swearing you know it's serious when God says I swear today God is saying to you in Christ is already all the blessings but if something in Christ is missing maybe you're single you're ready to mingle and you're looking for a spouse and you're like Vlad I don't find a scripture where on the cross Jesus died to give me a spouse well God says with Jesus if not in Jesus then with Jesus I'll give you everything else sickness is from the devil a hundred percent God does not send sickness he doesn't have it to give it Satan is a thief if God gave permission for you to be sick then Satan is not a thief when he took your health because a thief is someone who takes something without permission Satan can't be a thief if he takes what God gives him I believe Satan is a thief because he took our health and that without permission and today the best way to do with thieves is you catch them if you recognize today that sickness is illegal in your body you're already catching a thief healing will be yours the Bible says Jesus came to heal oppressed by the devil it doesn't say Jesus came to heal those God made sick it says he came to heal oppressed by the devil you may say but what about Job Job got sick Job is not your standard Jesus is Job is not someone who died on the cross for you Jesus did and he is our perfect theology sickness is from the devil as long as you believe that God sent the sickness you're playing a hypocrite I'm going to show you how because on a Sunday service you make sickness holy on Monday morning you fight it with every medicine antibiotics and every doctor in town that's hypocrisy I want you to be real with yourself if you're fighting against sickness on Monday through Saturday and believe it's evil on Sunday don't switch your position just because something and someone told you that somehow God can use it for his glory just because God used a donkey to speak to a prophet it does not mean we all should get donkeys and hear from a donkey what God has to say for our generation God's exceptions is not God's standard God's standard is Jesus Christ God's standard is I want to heal your body God's standard is I want to restore your health God is God's standard Apostle Paul, Elisha, Job are the exceptions but Jesus is who we worship and Jesus is who we honor. If your mind is confused today about sickness and you think well it's a little pet I have, God is using it for my glory, you don't have confidence to pray for healing. I want you to put that pet on the altar right now and I want you to accept what God says in his word, in Christ is your healing. If you don't believe in Christ is your healing then with Christ is your healing but you have to have healing. Amen. I want you to rise to your feet. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.